Today is uh, some, it's not a fun lesson. It's not one of my favorites. And I'm gonna teach it to you in two different ways. And I hope it doesn't confuse you. But I like to approach this topic from a conceptual slash geometry standpoint versus a calculus standpoint. That sentence makes no sense to you. It will by the end of the lesson, okay? So in other words, I'm gonna give you a formula to use, which I don't like at all. And in fact, I can never remember it, but I'm also gonna give you a geometric slash algebra approach to the problem that I think is a lot easier, but it does require an understanding of the concept. Some of you are not concept people, you're memorizers. So just give me a formula, I'll plug and chug it. That's okay. That's why I wanna show you both. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the inverse functions. Some of this is a pre-calculus review, like what is an inverse function, that kind of stuff. Uh, so today, we're gonna talk about an inverse function. Is this function an inverse of that function? All inverses, sorry, let me start over. All functions have inverses. The question we're going to address is, is that inverse also a function? Does that statement make sense? Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And I think you've already done that in pre-cal, hopefully. Then we're gonna find, this is the nasty part. We're gonna find the derivative of an inverse function. It's also new to everybody because we haven't done that before. That's where I'm gonna show you two different approaches. And then try to eat some healthier food. It's hard to do, I know. But that's your goal for today, okay? I'm vegetarian. What's the matter? I'm vegetarian. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you eat healthy food. Well, I eat Okay, then you're done, check. Um, now, you just, now you just need three more checks and you're good for the day. One out of four is not too bad. No, it's not 25%. <laughs> that's not bad. I mean, that's, it's a start. It's better than a zero, right? Yeah. yeah. It's better than 24%. Well, and I would imagine, she, you, you can probably figure out if one function is another function, or is, is an inverse of another function, right, Shaywan? Huh? You can do the first one, right? Sure. You can tell if two functions are inverses of each other. Sure. Okay. Can you, well, well, never mind. We'll, we'll see how you do on your checklist later. Okay, so let's do a review. Functions and their inverses. Now, notice the notation. F to the negative one is not the reciprocal. Don't get that confused. That button on your calculator that says X to the negative one does not magically find the inverse. That's a reciprocal button. These are inverses. What do inverses do? They undo the function. So, for instance, if I have a function of x squared, its inverse is square rooting, because square rooting undoes squaring. Adding 5, its inverse would be subtracting 5. You get the idea. Step 1, or important point number 1, is something that people commonly forget about and we will make use of a lot, because nobody likes to work with a range. I shouldn't say that. Very few people like to work with a range. I hate figuring out a range. But I can find a domain all day long. So the thing to remember is that the domain and range switch when you talk about the inverse. The domain of a function is the range of the inverse. The range of a function is the domain of the inverse. And we can use that very sneakily, like if, for instance, I say to you, what is the domain of the inverse? You can find the domain of the inverse by finding the range of the inverse of, of the original function. We'll get to that later. And then step two is this big stuff that I know you've done before. If you make a composite function out of a function and its inverse, you will get x. And you have to check it for both. f of f inverse of x equals x, and f inverse of x equals x. Plug one into the other, solve it. Plug the other into the one, solve it. Please tell me you knew this already. Good. Okay, we good? Good? All right. So let's verify that these two functions are inverses. I've made the hypothesis that uh, f of x and g of x are inverses, so I need to check it. I need to do, whoops, I need to do f of g of x, 
and see what that equals. And I need to do g of f of x and see what that equals. Okay, so let's do this first. Let's put g of x into f of x. 2 times the cubic root of x plus 1 over 2 cubed. Okay, and I don't want to beat a dead horse because I think that you all can see what's happening here. But cubing a cubic root, that's going to cancel with that. Multiplying by 2 and dividing by 2 cancels with that. And, oh, duh, there we go. 1 minus 1 is 0, and sure enough, we get to x. Wow, had a meltdown there for a second. Okay, what about f of x? That's the cubic root of 2x cubed minus 1 plus 1 all over 2. And then hilarity ensues. Negative 1 plus 1 goes away. The 2s cancel. The cubic root of x cubed, and sure enough, whoop bam, we're done. They are inverses of each other. Okay, pop quiz. Anybody feel free to chime in, see what you remember from pre-calc. If I give you a function, how do you find its inverse? Anybody remember? Everybody here? Switch the y and the x and solve. We'll do that in a second. Okay, but yes, that's correct. Okay, so I did that. Okay, so let's stop here at this picture. This picture is an example of, oh, my internet connection is unstable. Um, a method that I'm going to use to help you with this lesson. Okay, so the black graph, f of x, is our original function. The gray graph is the inverse. We've already verified that those are inverses. But the thing to notice that's really important is that line y equals x pops in there. And notice that if I reflect the black graph over the line y equals x, I get the gray graph. So the a function and its inverses are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. That's crucial for what we're going to do later. Okay, so let me say it again so you've seen it and heard it twice. A function and its inverse are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. And the other thing in red that you probably already know, if you reflect a point over the line y equals x, the x and the y coordinates change places. So the point 2, 3 goes to the point 3, 2. The point negative 7, 10 goes to 10, negative 7. We're going to use all that stuff later. Okay. I don't think we've done any calculus yet, but again, inverses are never a very liked function or a very liked topic. So these are kind of glanced over in pre-calc, and it depends on how in-depth you went into it last year. But hopefully you've seen all this stuff before. I know you've seen this. How do I know if the inverse of a function is also a function? So before I click on the next thing, can somebody refresh my memory on the vertical line test? What does the vertical line test do? And therefore? And therefore? You're 100% true, but what do, what do we really want to use the vertical line test for? What does it tell us? Bingo, if it's a function. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what you described is a situation called one-on-one, -on -one, or one-to-one, -one, which we'll get to in a second. Okay. And if it's one-to-one, -one, it's got to be a function. Okay. Vertical line test tells you, hey, this thing is a function. Okay. This parabola is a function because no matter where I draw a vertical line, it's going to hit only in one spot, so every x has one y. Right. This circle is not a function because if I draw a vertical line through there, I hit in two spots. Okay. Good. Now, we're going to talk about, well, actually, before I click again, let's go back. If I take a vertical line and I reflect it over the line y equals x, 
So for instance, the y-axis is a vertical line. If I reflect it over the line y equals x, it becomes a horizontal line. So any vertical line that we would use to check, we could reflect and become a horizontal line, which leads us to the horizontal line test. What is the horizontal line test? Well, as it says, the horizontal line test checks to see if a function's inverse is also a function. Okay. If a function's inverse is also a function. Okay. So this upside down parabola, it is a function because it passes the vertical line test. It is, its inverse is not a function because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. In other words, the horizontal line test is the vertical line test flipped over the line y equals x. That's what causes some confusion for people when they think that inverses and inverse functions are the same thing. They are different. I can take any picture and reflect it over the line y equals x. That doesn't guarantee it's going to be a function. We want inverse functions. So the original function has to be able to pass that horizontal line test. And you've seen that already, right? Yes? Pre-calc maybe? No? Some of you look confused. Maybe, yeah. Just glance right over it. Okay, good. I think, oh yeah, a uh, little bit about inverse functions. Uh, so here's the one-to-one -one that we've already talked about. Okay, one-to-one. -one. Every x has one y, every y has one x. F is stri uh -oh. strictly monotonic. What the heck does that mean? I wouldn't expect you to know, but strictly monotonic means always increasing and always decreasing. So we're going to spend a lot of time determining whether or not a function is monotonic or strictly monotonic. Is it always increasing? Is it always decreasing? So you take something like a, a parabola. A parabola is not strictly monotonic. It increases, then decreases. A cubic, however, can sometimes be strictly monotonic, always increasing. So notice if it's strictly monotonic, it will have no max and no min. Or another way to say this is f prime of x is always positive, or f prime of x is always negative. Okay, so now I think we're gonna start doing some calculus. Notice the question. Do these functions have inverse, have an inverse function? It's not saying does it have an inverse, because it does. I can take that cubic and reflect it over the line y equals x. What we're wondering is, is it a function? Okay. So one way to check that, graph it, see if it passes the horizontal line test. Okay. Good, pre-calc approach to it. The other way is to calculate what the inverse is and see if that's a function. But now it's time to use some calculus. We're gonna make use of this idea of strictly monotonic to solve this problem. Okay, so f prime of x, I picked an easy function here, 3x squared plus one. What can you tell me about that derivative function? By the way, can you Zoomers hear me if I move away from the computer? Are you still good to go? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, please. Okay, thank you. Say again. Parabola. It is a parabola. Okay, what else? Uh, 
is f prime of x always greater than zero? Is f prime of x always less than zero? Or is it a combo? There we go. For those of you that didn't hear her, she said it's always going to be positive. Do you all recognize the fact that this function will always be positive? Doesn't matter what I put in there for x. I put in a negative number, a negative, negative number squared is positive, times 3 plus 1, always going to be positive. I put in a 0, good to go, positive number, good to go. Therefore, this is the case that we're dealing with here f prime of x is always greater than 0. Therefore, it's strictly monotonic. Therefore, its inverse is a function. I would argue that that's a lot easier than any of the other methods I outlined. Num or number b, oh boy. Part b, f prime of x is 3x squared minus 1. OK, that screws things up. Not always positive. Not always negative, therefore not strictly monotonic, and not an inverse function. I shouldn't say that. It doesn't have an inverse function. It has an inverse. That inverse is not a function. OK, so let me stop for a second. Does that make sense? OK. We have, go ahead, Max. Because according to what we talked about here, it's strictly monotonic if it's always increasing. How do we know if a function is increasing or decreasing? We look at the derivative. If the derivative is positive, it's increasing. If the derivative is negative, it's decreasing. OK? Any other questions? OK. Here's some pictures. If you, and I save this to the end because it would spoil all the fun. Notice that this function is always increasing. If it's always increasing, it's strictly monotonic. The other one, where is it? Here it is. This one is not always increasing. It's more of what we consider a traditional cubic function. It's got a max, it's got a min, and therefore not strictly monotonic, and therefore its inverse is not a function. This is a function, but its inverse is not. OK, this is what we talked about earlier. The old school way of finding an inverse function. Not old school, but this is the way you can find an inverse function. If you need to know what an inverse function is, you can find it by doing this. Switch the x's and the y's, solve for y. And what you're left with is f prime. It would be nice if you could do that for everything. However, you know that we're going to run into a function where that doesn't work out so nicely. Okay. Example. Y equals the square root of 2x minus 3. Okay, go. Calculate the inverse of that function. Please be careful with notation. So when you're done, it should say f inverse of x is equal to blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. John, what do you got, buddy? I got uh, f inverse of x equals x squared plus 3. Plus, I'm sorry? 3 over 2. The whole thing over 2 or just 3 halves? The whole thing over 2. Thank you. That. Yeah? 
Okay, so what did you do from uh, from where I left off? Perfect. Easy peasy. Well done. And then, of course, change this y into the proper notation, and there's our inverse function. If we didn't trust John, we could check it by taking this and plugging it in there to make sure we get x. And take this and plug it in there to check and make sure we have x. But there's no reason to doubt John, so we're going to move on. It would be nice if all the functions were this simple. That's not going to be the case. Okay, so we're going to have to come up with some other ways to do this. Okay, so there's a picture. If you like pictures, there's what we got. Great. Okay, strictly monotonic. Okay, great. Okay, and then, yeah, we did that already. To verify it, there we go. Since we, I guess we didn't trust John. All right, here comes the fun. Derivative of an inverse function. Okay, so let's talk about one way to do it that no one's going to use. And one way to do it was, is, I should say, let's suppose you have a function and you want to find the derivative of the inverse. You could do exactly what John just did, calculate the inverse, then take the derivative. But that's seldomly, if ever, going to happen because you're not going to get a function that that's pretty nor are you going to get a function that it's that easy to calculate the inverse. Okay. We're going to do this without really calculating the inverse. So we're going to put that idea aside and then I'm going to show you two others. I'm going to save my method for the end because this first one is, is kind of uh, intimidating. Okay. So here's a function. If you love a function, or sorry, if you love a formula, here's the formula. This is what you're going to use to find the derivative of the inverse of a function. I'm not going to talk too much about this formula now. I'll talk more about it after I've shown you my technique, because my technique takes, I think, some more logical uh, steps, which are wrapped up in this formula. And therefore, this formula, if you're a formula person, will make sense after we've done everything. Okay? So let me click through a couple of slides and show you how to do it using this technique, and then I'll show you how I like to do it. Okay. So we have this function, 1 fourth x cubed plus x minus 1. Now, could you use the method that I talked about? Could you calculate what f inverse of x is? I, I couldn't. I could not, so I got to be honest with you, I could not solve this. I would not how to solve I would not know how to solve that for y. So that first method is off the table. Okay, go away. So now we go to the second method, which is the formula. And we're going to do it for x equals 3. And eventually we're going to work down to part b, where part b has the value of the derivative of the inverse but we have to do a little bit more work first. Okay, so here, here's what it looks like. First things first, and I cheated a little bit here. If I'm looking for this, that means that the point three is on the, the sorry, let me rephrase that. The x value of the point on the inverse is 3. What I don't know is the y value. Okay. 
So if it's the x value on the inverse, it's the y value on the original function. Does that statement make sense? Because it's important. Zoomers, should I say it again or did you follow me on that? We're good. I got a, th I got a thumbs again. up. Say it again. The y value on the, sorry, I said it backwards. Hold on. Take a deep breath. The x value on the inverse is the same as the y value on the function. The y value on the inverse is the same thing as the x value on the function. Okay, so I have an x value of 3 on the inverse, which means that y has to be equal to 3 on the original value, on the original function. So I made a big leap here. Where did that 2 come from? Uh, we're going to call that math magic. What I did is I set this equal to 3 and solved. Okay, that's not easy to do, and in fact, I cheated. I rigged the problem to see that, to guarantee that I have nice, pretty answers. I actually got two by graphing it and, and doing a bunch of other stuff. Okay, that's not the issue. So what do I know now? I know that if three comma two is on the inverse, then two comma three is on the function. Okay. That's crucial. And that's crucial because it's used in both methods. Does everybody follow that? Took the value from the inverse function for x, set it equal to the original function, and solved. And again, we're not going to get bogged down to where that comes from. You're just going to have to trust me that it, it works out. OK, so now I need to find this. Okay, so using the theorem, we get this. All I did here, why does my internet just keep going crazy? Um, all I did there is I plugged and chugged into the formula. This, we solved on the previous slide. Because again, if the point 0.32 is on the inverse, then the point 0.23 is on the function. Now I need this. F prime of 2. Well, that makes sense. You go back to the function, you take the derivative, you plug in 2, and you get your answer. Okay. Click on that. We get that. Okay, so the thing that we're going to focus on is this answer. And I'm going to show you how to do this a different way. And it's going to require a little bit of a picture here. So is everybody okay with this first? I, and I know you might not be able to wrap your head around it yet. So let me show you a different technique and then hopefully things will start to be a little clearer. Okay, so we're gonna remember one quarter is the answer. I'm gonna show you, I'm just getting some working space here because I wanna draw a picture. All right, so let's suppose I have a function and we'll just use this function as an example. Okay, so we'll call that f of x. And I'm going to put on that function a point a comma b. And then flying through the middle of this puppy, I have the line y equals x. So therefore, the inverse would look something like that. So that's f inverse And this point would come over here and be the point B comma A. Okay, questions so far? Good. All right. What the problem that we just did is saying, what is the slope of the tangent line at this point? Okay. What is the derivative of the inverse at the point B comma A. So here's how I solve the problem. I don't ever deal with the inverse. What I do is I deal with the original function and I remember one little twist at the end. So what I'm going to do, we know from the problem that this point is at 3 comma 2, which makes this point at 2 comma 3. Okay, and as I go through this, if I lose anybody, please stop me now. It'll be easier to fix it when we're there than at the very end. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the equation of the tangent line of the original function. And then here's the twist. You'll notice that the tangent line of the inverse and the tangent line of the function are both represented with lines there. The thing to remember is that the slopes here, let's call that slope one and slope two, are reciprocals of each other. Not opposite reciprocals. They're not perpendicular. They're just reciprocals of each other. Okay? And I wouldn't expect you to realize that on your own. But how am I going to solve this problem using my method? I'm going to find the derivative of f. I'm going to plug in 2. I'm going to take my answer. And I'm going to flip it over. Okay. Um, without going back, can somebody tell me what f of x is, please? It was 1 fourth x cubed plus x minus 1 plus x minus 1, okay? So again, let me refresh your memory, or let me say it again before I dive into this. I'm going to find the derivative of the function at the point generated by the inverse, and then I take my answer and flip it over. Okay, so f prime of x is 3 fourths x squared plus 1. I'm going to find f prime of 2 which is 4. Oh, that makes me happy. And then flip it over. So f inverse, the derivative at 3, which is from the original inverse, is going to be 1 over 4, which is the answer I got before. If the point 3, 2 is on the inverse, then the point 2, 3 is on the original function. Okay. I just remember you said you did like math magic, so you don't have to worry about that, right? No, that for this particular answer I did, or for this particular example, I did math magic to find that too. What you would normally do is figure it out by setting the equal and solving. Well, do we don't have to use the other equation to get the 3, 2? Where does the 1, 4 come? Okay, going from here to here, yeah. made use of this. Okay. So what this is, this is going to get really confusing. Let me see. This is the slope of that line. Okay. If I flip it over, I all of a sudden get this to be the slope of that line, which is what we're looking for. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I know this is confusing. It's even more confusing because I gave you three different techniques to find it. What you have to decide is which one are you going to use, which one works best for your brain. So if I go back to the formula again, whoops, that guy, you see now where, this, where what I did comes into play. Notice the reciprocal is wrapped up in the function, one over a bunch of gunk. This, gesundheit. This chunk of it allows me to find the x-coordinate on the original function. And then this is the derivative at that new point. OK, so one last thing, and I'll stop saying it over and over again. If I want to know this, uh, you know what? I'm not even going to use that. Hold on. Let's use some function h of x. Let's suppose I want to do that. I want to find the derivative of the inverse of the function h at the point 5. That means 5 is on the inverse. So 5 comma, let's make up a number here, 5 negative 1 is on the inverse. Therefore, negative 1 comma 5 is on the function. didn't even know it does that. Why would I do that? If I wanted to play peekaboo? That's weird. Why is that a built-in function of PowerPoint? Are you ever like draw on that black screen? Oh! 
Oh my God. That's life altering. It's like a built in notepad with a black background, which we already know is sexy. All right, where was I? I'm sorry, my mind just got blown. I, I'm afraid to press the other buttons though, because they might do something equally amazing. Okay, so, all right, hold on, let me finish. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out. All right, so now I know that that point is on the function. So what I'm gonna do is find eight, You're seeing this happen, right? <laughs> and now what? Uh, anyways, sorry. I'm going to do h prime of negative 1. Take the derivative of the function, plug in negative 1, get an answer. That answer, I'm going to then flip it over, and I'll get this. OK? So again, I, I don't care which one you want to use. It does rely on a ton of conceptual um, happenings, if you will. Okay, how do you find this point? This is the key to finding the problem, not only for my method, but for this method also, because you have to be able to find that point on the original function. So what I could have done is just done this, drawn all that out, and then come back to it which would look a lot neater than that. That looks like a train wreck. Okay, so we got that already, we're good to go. Okay, so let's try this one. No, we don't, we don't wanna do that. We did that already. I told you, the reciprocal slopes. I'm gonna skip that. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, fantastic, we're done. That last slide is just ridiculous. We knew that already, the reciprocal slopes. Okay. It's going to take some practice, no doubt about it. Okay. Understanding the elements to it, in my opinion, are more important than understanding the mechanics because you know how to do the mechanics. You know how to take a derivative. You know how to solve a function for x or for y to find that value. It's understanding what you're doing.